Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you're with us today for this next installment in this series we've entitled Kairos. Uh, you can see by your message notes, if you got those on the way in, or if those of you watching online, if you go to centeringlives.com, you can download the message notes there. You can see that Kairos is an old Greek term. The Greeks had two terms for time. One was chronos, and so they would have called a watch a chronometer. It measures hours, minutes, and seconds. But they had another word for time that was about being at the opportune moment or being in the right time, and that was kairos. It's a God-given moment or season when, that, when you have the opportunity to do something. And sometimes those are moments, as we've been praying about all through this series, and if, you've, if, this, if this is the first time you've joined us, hope you can go back over the last couple of weeks and, and uh, hear some different dimensions of this. But today we're going to be talking about, well, sometimes we have opportunities that we walk into that are necessary. There are opportune moments that are necessary. We weren't particularly looking for them, but they're here. Uh, an example of this would be last Thanksgiving. Uh, Debbie and I were excited to have uh, our kids coming home for Thanksgiving, grandchildren, even her extended family. We we're all gonna have Thanksgiving at our house. And um, then the week of Thanksgiving, her dad went to the hospital and the night before he passed away. And so on Thanksgiving Day, uh, we sat around as a family and we shared memories of Debbie's dad, my father-in-law. And there were many. And it turned out to be a, a wonderful time where we shared some things that were just very touching, other things that were funny memories and bad camping trips or whatever, you know, that type of thing. Um, but we used the time and it was an opportune moment that we made the most of, but it wasn't how we started out. Does this make sense to everyone? We're gonna have those times in our lives when we go, hey, I really wanted to do something else, but I see now this is more important. If that makes sense to you, then everything I'm gonna tell you today will also make sense. Because in the book of Jude, it's really just a short letter right before the last book of the Bible, Revelation, there's a little short letter written by Jude, and I'll introduce you if you don't know who he is. Nothing to do with, hey, Jude, the Beatles song. Nothing to do with it. Nothing. Okay. I don't know if that song has anything to do with anything. But, but the point is, is nothing to do with that. But we're going to hear from him today. And he was setting out to write one thing, ended up writing something that was much more important because he had to. I'm going to have a word of prayer for us, and we're going to jump right in. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I thank you for your word, which is our guide in all matters of faith and practice, and that today we're reading a uh, letter written from uh, Jude, uh, someone who grew up with Jesus. And so, Father, I just pray that you will speak and move me out of the way. Uh, he gave a strong warning to people. There were false teachings creeping into the life of the church and he wanted them to be on their guard. He wanted them to defend the faith. And so, Lord, uh, this was his moment to speak up. And, Lord, I think we're going to have many moments in our culture. That's why we're reading this. We need to take a stand and defend the faith at times. And, Lord, today I pray that you'll show us some important considerations on that. Pray these things in the name of Jesus. Move me out of the way, Lord. Say whatever you want said to us today. Amen. Kind of our verse for the whole series, by the way, is Ephesians 5.16. The Apostle Paul said, make good use of every opportunity. That's every kairos moment you have because these are evil days. I mean, if you haven't thought about it lately, you may have even thought about it. You go, yeah, we are kind of living in evil days. We sure are. And that's why we're going to be looking at Jude this week and next week. Uh, we started a little bit last week, but we're, we're going to really get into it this week and next week. But... Jude was, and this is point A, Jude was an early church leader and he encouraged first century Christians to make the most of every opportunity they had to contend for the faith against ungodly people who were teaching false things. Um, and they're going to wind their way into the church. You're going to see this. They're going to wind their way into Christian circles. And it happens because there is a devil in the world and he would love to keep us confused. So first of all, Jude was Jesus' half-brother. Remember, Jesus was placed into Mary's womb. She was a virgin. And Joseph married her anyway. And everybody thought that Joseph and Mary had an illegitimate kid. They did not. 
Jesus was placed into Mary's womb by the Holy Spirit. And so he was born of Mary. Mary gave birth to him. And so Mary was his mother, but our Heavenly Father was the one who placed Jesus into the womb. Well, Joseph and Mary had other kids, okay? Um, and I'll show you that in a minute here. But he was Jesus' half-brother. He was, Jude was one of his brothers. And he didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah until after his resurrection. I mean, I just want to show you this. And this is important in this understanding him and his motivations so we can understand where he's coming from in this letter. This letter is from Jude. This is the opening statement to the book of Jude or the letter of Jude. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Now, I'll come back to that in a little bit, but just if we go down to the Matthew 13 reference there, this is where it talks about that Jesus had uh, four brothers and a couple of sisters. Uh, this is one of the places, multiple places in the New Testament. Jesus returned to Nazareth, his hometown. He went and taught there in the synagogue, and everybody was amazed and said, well, where does he get all this wisdom, the power to do miracles? And they scoffed, ah, he's just the carpenter's son. We know Mary, his mother, and they were talking about Joseph, his dad, the carpenter's son. Um, and we also know his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, and that's Jude. Jude is just short for Judas. So don't let that throw you off. You go, oh, I don't know if that's the same. Well, I know some guys named Peter. They're called Pete. I think you see how we made the leap. <laughs> Wait, is that a whole different guy? Yeah, it's the same guy. Judas, Jude, you know, Megan, Meg. I, I, you got it. Okay, anyway, we're going on. So, uh, but uh, all his sisters live right here among us too. Okay, so we don't know the names of Jesus. Joseph and Mary had other kids. Jesus was the oldest, but they had four sons and at least two daughters. All of his sisters just means plural. I mean, so we don't know. It's not recorded anywhere. But where did he learn all these things? And they were deeply offended and they refused to believe in him. That was people in his hometown. Well, what about his own family? Well, John 7, verses 2 through 5, but soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters. Every fall there would be, according to Leviticus 23, the Jews would have a uh, special festival to commemorate their pilgrimage from Egypt to the Promised Land. And so they would have a festival of shelters or booths. It would be like a festival of tents where you had to camp out for a week to remind yourself of the wilderness wanderings. Well, anyway, um, it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters. And Jesus' brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea. They were up in Galilee in the north. And they said, you need to go down south in Judea where the major population centers where Jerusalem is and other things um, so, that, so that people can know who you are. That's where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. This is Jude and James and the other brothers talking to him. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. So Jesus grew up with some guys, grew up with brothers, three, four brothers and at least two sisters. And apparently they didn't believe in him until after the resurrection. Good news is, and if you go to the book of Acts, and first chapter of Acts, it says that the disciples gathered to pray, waiting for the Holy Spirit to fall at Pentecost, and joining them were Jesus' mother Mary and his brothers. And so Jude would have been one of the people praying with the disciples, and he became a leader in the early church. So the letter we're going to read today is from a guy who grew up around Jesus, but he didn't believe in Jesus. In fact, he was one of the people that said, hey, if you're trying to make a name for yourself, don't stick around up here in the north where there's not that many people. Go down south around Jerusalem. If you want to be famous, go to the population centers. I mean, talk to the masses. Show them all your miracles, Jesus. I mean, they didn't believe in him. And they thought he came to be famous and he was doing all these, he was teaching what he was teaching and doing these miracles to make a big name for himself. Can you imagine a sibling thinking ill about another sibling? Mm. Just don't know a family like that. Anyway, yeah, all of us can imagine. Yeah, if you have any brothers, this, yeah, it would be hard for that, for a brother or sister to believe this. But Jesus, um, they were saying, Jesus, you're just trying to make a name for yourself. And they believed in the world system of fame and notoriety. If you're going to get ahead in this world, here's how you do it. They didn't understand at all that Jesus didn't come for fame or notoriety. He came to die on the cross for you and me to pay the penalty for our sins. 
He knew full well that when he went to Jerusalem, he was going there and they were going to kill him. Murder him on the cross. And you know why? Because he loves you and me so much. He died on the cross because John Schmidt is a filthy, rotten sinner and he died on the cross to take my place. Well, you don't have to amen that I was a filthy, rotten sinner so enthusiastically. <laughs> it's true. But so are you. Yeah, there we go. Oh, okay, amen. He died on the cross to take our place. And Jude came to realize that. My brother wasn't trying to show off. I mean, their mom had told them about the shepherds and the wise men. The mom had told them about Jesus. And apparently it all clicked after they saw Jesus die on the cross. And they saw him after he rose from the dead. And so now, if you, I know some of you turned the page. If you go back, just, if you guys can put that Jude 1-1 reference up there again. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. He doesn't even introduce himself as Jesus' half-brother. He just introduced himself as a slave. And that word there is a word called pronounced doulos. And it just means a bond slave. Somebody who willingly said, I will be your servant for the rest of my life. And so Jude introduces himself this way. This is so amazing. He's going, I just thought he was my brother seeking fame. And now I realize what a fool I was. I will serve him the rest of my life. He died for me. He's the Messiah the savior of the world. I want to serve him the rest of my life. So he says, I'm a servant of Jesus and a brother of James. James, another brother of Jesus, half brother of Jesus, became a great leader in the church. So he didn't even claim any special position. He didn't feel worthy of that. Now all this is important because he's going to say some strong things. And when somebody says strong things, the question is, why are they saying strong things? Is he trying to make a name for himself? No. That's what he entirely, that's what he got so wrong about Jesus. And so in this letter, you'll see this now. He's going, hey, I want to appeal to you. There's danger coming. People are working their way into the church, teaching all kinds of false things. And I'm not doing that to attack you or to attack anybody else. I'm telling you, we got to protect the faith and contend for the faith or else we're going to get way off track here. There is a devil who'd love to get us all twisted around. Brings us to point two. Jude was writing to believers who knew that God loved them. They knew that God had sent Jesus to rescue them from sin and death, and he called them to live new lives. This is the salvation we all share. This is the salvation we all share. This is how Jude put it. I'm writing to all who have been called by God, the Father who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy and peace and love. Jude was writing to early Christians. If you've experienced God's love in your heart and his forgiveness, and you've experienced the fact that he called you away from a life of sin, and he set you apart, and he's keeping you safe, and he's watching over you, then this is a letter for you. By the way, if you're here today and you don't have that kind of relationship with Jesus, this is a letter for you too. Because I want to remind you that it reminds us over and over again how much God loves you. He really did send his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for every sin of ours, all of them, in full, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done. And he goes on and he says, dear friends, I've been eagerly planning to write you about the salvation we all share. The salvation we all share is this, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. None of us are any closer because we're any smarter or any taller or any prettier or any... Uh, more clever, or maybe we've done more good things than the other person. We all have fallen short of God's glory by a million miles. And we come to Christ because of what Jesus did for us, not because of all the great things we've done for Jesus. This is a salvation we all share. I meant to read this last week. I, I was able to get it in at the last service right at the end. So I'm, the second service, people are going to hear it again. But I want us to read this paragraph from Ephesians 2 here. Paul talks about the same thing. He says, look, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of this unseen world. He's a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way. 
all of us used to live, we're all born sinners with a sin nature. We inherited it from our parents. That's why it was so important that Jesus was placed inside of Mary's womb. He never inherited a sin nature like the rest of us. I'm a sinner. My parents were sinners. Grandma and grandpa were sinners. Great grandma, great grandpa, they were sinners. All the way back to Adam and Eve. Same for you. Same for you. Same for everybody else in the world. And so Paul writes to him and he said, look, the devil is the spirit at work in all the hearts of those who refuse to obey God, which is the way we all are before we come to Christ. And he says, all of us used to live that way following the devil. All of us used to live that way. Can we say that little sentence together, please? All of us used to live that way. One more time. All of us used to live that way. And so Jude is reminding people, I grew up with Jesus and I didn't believe him. Even though I saw him do miracles, I'd heard the story of the shepherd and the wise men and mom and dad had told me about all that stuff. I didn't believe any of it. But I saw him die on the cross and I saw him rise from the dead. And I want to tell you, I'm a willing servant of him the rest of my life. And so if you understand that Jesus came to save you and you experience his grace and his love and his peace, then this is a letter for you because I want you to experience more and more mercy and peace and love. Oh, I've been planning to write you. And when Paul wrote, he says, look, we used to all run after the devil, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. But God is so rich in his mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. Grace means undeserved kindness. It's only because God is so outrageously loving that, we're, that any of us are going to make it into heaven at all, that any of us are forgiven of our sins. I don't deserve it, neither do you. It's what Paul wanted everybody to know. It's what Jude wanted everybody to know. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, but this is a salvation we all share. We, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. Some of us aren't closer than others. There were lots of religious leaders in Jesus' day, and they said, no, the ground is not level. A lot of us have been very religious. We're, we got, we're a shoe in for heaven. There's other people, they're not going to make it. And Jesus said, no, you don't understand the game at all. If I don't die for your sins, there's no hope for you. I have to pay the penalty for you. And that's how important it is. Paul, 1 Corinthians 6, talks about this some more. Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or worship idols or commit adultery or male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or are greedy people or are drunkards or abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. Paul gives a laundry list there, everything from idolatry to adultery to male prostitution to homosexuality to thieves to greedy people, drunkards, abusers, cheaters. And he could have gone on. He just did this whole list that nobody's going to focus on one thing. Why are you attacking all the drunkards? Why do you have it in for all the homosexuals? Why do you have it in for all the idolaters? Why are you picking on them? Paul's going, no, I'm not. It's the other point I'm trying to make. All of us are sinners. We all need Jesus. And the reason I'm going into this, and Jude's talking about the salvation we all share, is because he's about to tell us that there are people sneaking their way into the church that are saying, no, you don't need to repent of those sins. You don't need to come to Jesus. You don't need to be washed those sins. Just keep on sinning. You're fine. God doesn't care. And Jude says this is dangerous, and you're about to see it here. That's point three. Jude encouraged believers to contend for the faith against false teachers who'd slipped in among them. I wanted to write you about salvation. I wanted to write you about Jesus and this wonderful salvation we have. I'm his servant. But now I find that I must write about something else urging for you urging you to defend, to contend for the faith that God, excuse me, that God has entrusted us once for all time and his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches. Wormed their way in. We're going to unpack this more next week, but I'm trying to remind us here that this has been going on since the church first started. This letter of Jude was written like 30, 35 years after Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. 
I mean, it's one of the earliest letters we have in the whole Bible. So this was happening from the beginning. A couple of notes here. I want to introduce you to a word. If you don't know this one, it's pronounced apostasy. If somebody is apostate or they teach apostasy, what that means is it's refusing to continue to follow or obey or recognize a religious faith. Right now, in the United States, we have whole denominations that are splitting, and they're splitting over whether or not we can still teach the Bible. Because our culture has changed. And we no longer hold these things anymore. And a whole range, on a whole range of issues. And when this happens, when we walk away from the faith that Christians have had since the time of Jude, then that's called apostasy because we're walking away. Peter talked about this. And he said this, uh, he said, I want to remind you, in the last days, scoffers are going to come mocking the truth and following their own desires. And following their own desires is what this is all about. Yeah, I don't care what the Bible says. That's not what I think. I don't care if that's what Christians have believed for 2,000 years. It's not what I want. And Jude was writing this then, and it's just as relevant now. I mean, thank God Jude had set out to write one letter, but he was sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and he wrote this so we can know how to respond today in 2023. It's important also to note when we contend for the faith, the Bible is our guide in all matters of faith and practice. That's why you hear me say this every week. Look, and that's why all these are Scripture references over and over, because people come in and go, well, John, who do you think you are? I don't think I'm anybody. And that's why these are chocked full of scripture references. I want you to see what the Bible says. I'm just trying to do my very best to clearly present it to you. All scripture is inspired by God, and it's useful to teach us what's true and make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what's right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. The common salvation we have is that we're all sinners and we were going the wrong way. And Jesus gave us, forgave our sins and shows us how to go the right way. So just want to remind us that when Paul gave us that laundry list of sins, it doesn't matter what it is. Sin is deliberate, determined independence from God. When I come to Christ, Jude said he came to Christ and it was deliberate, determined dependence on God. I'm going to be a servant. And so what God wants us to do, God wants us to simply repent. Repent means to turn around. If we're going this way and God is going this way, the right thing to do is turn around. It's always been that way. It's what Paul was talking about. We used to follow the ways of the devil. Now we don't have to. We can follow Jesus, but we have to repent and turn around. And Jude is warning. He's saying, I wanted to tell you about the salvation, but there's false teachers are coming in now, and they're telling you you don't need to repent. God doesn't care. I mean, if Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins... Well, belly on up to the bar. Jesus is paying. Let's send some more. Hmm. It's also important to note here, it's very possible for false teachers to work their way into Christian churches, into Christian homes, into Christian circles, because they disguise themselves. They are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles from Christ. This is Paul writing in 2 Corinthians 11, but I'm not surprised even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they'll get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. That brings us to point four. Jude encouraged believers to contend for the faith against false teaching that God's grace gives us a license to sin. Here's what Jude said. 
He said, I wanted to write to you about God's salvation, but instead, I need to warn you about some ungodly people who've wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied their, our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Remember, Jude said, I didn't believe in him, but now I know why he came. He came to die on the cross for my sins. I am a willful servant. I'm a voluntary servant the rest of my life. There was even a, a passage in the Old Testament that told people if you wanted to be a doulos, a bond servant like that, you could go to your master, and if you had worked for a certain number of years to pay off a debt and you were free to go and you say, I don't want to leave, I want to stay a servant the rest of my life, you, they would take you to a door frame and they would take an awl and they would punch a hole in your ear. And that would mark you the rest of your life as a bond servant. And James says, count me in. I want to be a bondservant of Jesus. He is my boss. When we say Jesus is Lord, it means Jesus is boss. And so you understand then, if I am sinning and I'm going the wrong way and Jesus and God's word tells me to go this way, and I say, I'm not going to repent, well, then I didn't understand the gospel message. Jesus died on the cross to save me from sin, to save me from idolatry. To save me from being abusive. To save me from a life of cheating or a life of drunkenness. And this is all part of the 12 steps. My life was unmanageable. And I realized God can manage it. That's step two. Step three is, I think I'll let him. But it doesn't mean I kept going the same way. I've got to turn around. The gospel message is a message of repentance. John the Baptist came preaching repentance for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus began his ministry and he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. On Pentecost Sunday, Peter stood up and he told all the people listening, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. My friends, I'm reading this to you because our culture needs to hear today a message where we need to tell people we need to repent. We're going the wrong way. But we also need to do it in love the way that Jude did. This is not some sort of mic drop. I mean, what Jude said was, he said, I want you to experience more mercy, peace, and love. Not, hey, I slammed that door shut, ended her career. Ha <laughs> ha. And that's what social media is doing these days. I mean, we're supposed to bring people back in love. Not body slam them. Paul, Romans 6.1. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that we were joined, when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now also we may live new lives. One of the reasons we want to meet with people before we baptize them is we want to make sure that we, we have a chance to talk to them about what baptism means. Baptism is a picture on the outside of what's going on on the inside. When I come to Christ, I'm saying, Christ, I come to you because I'm a filthy, rotten sinner. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I'm giving my life to you. So baptism shows, as we place people under the water, raise them up, that all our sins are washed away. If that's good news to you, say amen. amen. You know what else it shows? Baptism shows when we dip people under the water that I've died to myself. Exactly this passage. I've died to myself. I'm not going my own way anymore. I'm going to turn around and go God's way. John Schmidt died. I'm raised a new creature. The old John is dead. The John who is a willing bond servant to Jesus is who comes out of the water. Now, if that's good news to you, would you say amen? amen. Thirdly, baptism shows us that when my mortal body dies, because Jesus paid the penalty for my sins and he's preparing a place for me in heaven, I am by faith trusting that when my mortal body dies, I'll be raised to eternal life with him in heaven. And if that's good news to you, would you say amen? amen. All, th all three. But the picture of dying to myself is in there. 
Coming to Christ does not mean I say, I believe in Jesus. Now I'm going to live however I want till I die. That's not what it means. It means surrendering to Jesus. Punch here. I want to be like Jude. I'm writing y'all, I grew up with Jesus, but I didn't believe in him. You guys got to understand this. He came to die on the cross for our sins. This is the Apostle Paul. I just want to remind you, we all used to follow the devil. I did too. Paul was a persecutor of Christians. Jailed them, beat them up, tried to get them to deny Jesus. He said, you got to understand, we were all going the wrong way. But praise God, even though we didn't love Jesus, he loved us. And he found us. And that's where we come to him. He goes, don't let false teachers come in here and tell you that it doesn't matter. False teaching works its way in, worms its way in. I mean, I talk about this when I talk to young couples and they're getting married. I mean, a big thing that's wormed its way in through social media is that love is love. Whatever you define love is, that's fine. Just love is love. And always with couples who are getting married, I tell, I tell them, well, now, wait a minute. Understand this, when a couple falls in love and they've been dating a couple weeks and their hearts beat fast for each other and they just get chill bumps every time they see each other, they go, oh, I'm just in love with this person. I'm not denying that. But my wife and I, a couple weeks, will be married 37 years. And those chill bumps have not lasted all 37 years. This love is not the same as 37 years of committed love. And when I talk to people, they go, well, that's right. I go, well, if this love and this love are different, then love isn't love. Oh, right, right. But that has wormed its way in. We got to stand and say, that's not right. That's not right. Well, how do you know what's right? Well, the Bible tells us what love is like. That's why we got to work on this. There's more to be said next week. Oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm out of time. Mm. Okay, let me get the last point here. While making the most of every opportunity to contend for the faith, we must be careful not to fall into temptation ourselves. Look, we need to contend for the faith. We've got to warn people just the way Jude did, just the way Paul did. We beg you, we implore you, please come to Jesus. Please understand we're not trying to judge you. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm not trying to throw down on you. I'm not saying I'm smarter than you or better than you. You probably know a lot of people that are nicer than me. I mean, sometimes that even happens when I talk to people about this. And they go, well, who do you think you are, John Schmidt? I mean, I know some people aren't Christians, and they're smarter than you. And I go, well, that's entirely possible. Well, and I like them better than you. And I say, well, that's entirely possible, too. But... I didn't write the New Testament. The New Testament says we're all filthy, rotten sinners. We're not acceptable to God because we're smarter than John Schmidt. That's a pretty low bar anyway. But the reason that we're acceptable to God is because Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. You must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Do you realize when we contend for the faith, we may be snatching someone from the flames of judgment? Show mercy still to others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. If anybody ever tells you there's no place in the Bible where it says, love the sinner but hate the sin, yeah, there is. Jude 123, right here. Hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Love the sinner, hate the sin. It's in the Bible. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believe, believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. We pray for others, we help them, and we realize, hey, I don't want to get dragged into a bunch of bad behaviors that used to control me. The best person to help an alcoholic escape alcohol alcoholism is somebody who's working with AA. And by the way, we have an AA group that meets here on Thursday nights now. If you didn't know that, you can contact us. We'd love to tell you, but it's, it's here now. We have that going. If that's good news to you, would you say amen? amen? We want to help people out of that.
but we have to repent, whatever it is. Our culture is going to give a free pass to some sins and condemn some others. It's always been that way. But any sin, when it's deliberate, determined independence from God, is wrong. That's why we come to Jesus. He forgives us and loves us, places his Holy Spirit inside of us and changes us no matter who we are and gives us new lives. Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord, I ran out of time again. I'm glad I got another week on this. Lord, there's so much more I want to say. So, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity we've had to have a few minutes together. I thank you for Jude. I thank you for this letter. I thank you, Lord, that you stopped him. He was going to write about something else, and he wrote about this because we needed to hear this today. God, I want to love people. I want them to love you. I don't want to come across angry or obnoxious or prideful or anything. I just I want to be like Jude. It's like, oh, I just want you to experience love and joy and peace. But Lord, we can't stand by and just let people say crazy things like love is love and there's no difference between falling in love and mature love. I mean, that's, that's crazy. And that's just one example. Lord, we've got to be able to stand up for our faith and make things speak the truth in love. So give us wisdom on this. Uh, we've got more to say. We're going to say more next week. But Oh, Lord, I pray that this would be a good jumping off point today to spur us on so we can pull people aside and say, come on now, let's talk about this. If the Lord spoke to you about something here today, Would you say, Lord, I heard you? In the name of Christ we pray, amen.